seven. Uh, Yes. Any other question? So we Hello? Yes. Um there was a lecture this morning. Yeah. Um I uh how can we catch up the lecture if we missed it? Yes, so it has been recorded uh, and it will be put online. You, re you will receive an email about this, okay? Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so, uh, so I think uh, we are set. Yes. We can start uh, yeah, with the okay. next uh, lecture. Uh, I'm very happy to have Mahesh with us. He's okay, one of our uh, 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 research associates of uh, the QLS section. And um, so, and he's going to talk about fluctuations and in information in physical systems. So. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, and hello, everyone. My name is Mahesh. I am visiting from Okinawa, Japan. Uh, I was very much looking forward to a full audience, a full auditorium, but uh, uh, needs must. So I apologize for this suboptimal way of doing things, but uh, it's better than doing nothing. Uh, so uh, what I will be covering, uh, we have already put up uh, scanned notes of my first five lectures. Uh, Matteo or Erika will be sharing the link uh, with you all. So please don't worry about, uh, was there a question? Hello? Someone has uh, the mic on. Please check that your mic is off. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so Matteo or Erika will send you the link to the lecture notes. So please don't worry too much about uh, taking notes. Uh, sit back and uh, uh, enjoy the best you can. Uh, and please interrupt when, whenever you have questions. Uh, so the first lecture, uh, I titled it Noise in Physical Systems. and uh, uh, a, a word before I start, uh, since I did not know what level of preparation to expect from the students, I assumed it best not to uh, assume a level of preparation. So I, I decided to make the lecture not self-contained and I start from the very beginning, which is random variables and uh, probability distributions, which many of you may already be proficient in. And uh, just to give you all an idea of the plan of activity for today, I am Bundy, I'm giving the lecture one now. And tomorrow we will go as per the original uh, schedule, which is 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. Professor Redner will give his lecture to uh, Sydney Redner. And 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. I will give the lecture to. So let's begin. Uh, so uh, I will just keep it descriptive for several reasons. So before I start uh, a few points, uh, I want to tell you about what was the motivation be be behind starting uh, giving a series of lectures on fluctuations and noise and information. Uh, because fluctuations occur in almost every physical uh, situation we face uh, in our daily lives, especially if the phenomena that we are considering are time varying. And if the fluctuations arise in a human-made device, then we call it noise because typically we want to have some robustness built into the device to have very high signal fidelity or strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we will use the term fluctuations to here we will use the term fluctuations to include noise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sanas. You have a question. Okay, so uh, we will use the term fluctuations to include noise, uh, but understanding noise is central 
to understand in the design and performance of almost any physical device. So uh, noise sets essential limits on how such, how small a bit can reliably be stored or how fast it can be sent. So effective designs must recognize these limits that come from physics to us. So our first step will be an introduction to random variables uh, and some of their important probability distributions. Then we will turn to noise generation mechanisms and close with some more general thermodynamic insights into noise. Although noise can be surprisingly interesting in its own right, we will focus on concepts that lay the foundation for topics we will explore. But along the way, I also want to share some examples of open problems that have not been sorted out yet. So that uh, you have a flavor for what are the questions that remain unanswered, that if you find them interesting, you may go and tackle them. Eventually, we will move towards a more principled exploration of fluctuations in general physical systems by using these concepts to study the linear response regime of systems that are nominally removed from thermal equilibrium and then ask about what happens when the physical systems are driven far away from thermal equilibrium where we get very strongly nonlinear responses. Uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, experts in, in what I'm about to discuss or are already well versed in uh, e equilibrium statistical mechanics and are uh, students of non-equilibrium stat mech like myself, then you might have heard of terms like fluctuation relations and uh, Jarzinski equality, etc. So one point I want to make is throughout we will keep an eye out for what we can learn about a physical system or its underlying process from the fluctuations it exhibits. And finally, I'm an experimental physicist by training. I'm not a theorist by training. So my approach will not be towards theoretical rigor, but rather it will be towards uh, building physical intuition. And I'll be using uh, several examples from the real world uh, from, uh, and tr try to uh, encourage how experimental data are analyzed. So you'll be seeing plenty of experimental examples once we are past the conceptual stage. Okay, so without further ado, we'll get started. So, random variables. And once again, if you have any questions, please stop me and clarify it because we are working in under suboptimal conditions here. So, And we will begin with expectation values. So let us consider a fluctuating quantity. We will call it X of T, okay? So some fluctuating quantity that I will call X of T. And it could be the output of some noisy amplifier, it could be some time varying natural phenomenon, whatever have you. We are not imposing any conditions on the nature of this fluctuating quantity just yet. So if x is a random variable, then it is drawn from some probability distribution, which we will call p of x. So at this stage, I'm just starting with the nomenclature and the terminology, okay? So this means that it is not possible to predict the value of x at any instant, but the knowledge of the distribution does let us make some precise statements about the average value of quantities that depend on x. So the expected value, the expected value of a function f of x can be defined by an integral either over time or over a distribution which we will call angular brackets f of x in the limit of time going to infinity integral 0 to infinity sorry I'll just take from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2. f of x of t dt. This is the same as, oh yes, thank you. 
I have already made my first mistake. Now I feel, un feel comfortable. <laughs> this is the same as f of x times the probability distribution of x dx. Or a sum if the distribution is discrete. Here I have just assumed that it is a continuous distribution. Okay. Now, if I take f of x equals 1, shows that a probability distribution must be normalized. That is, one times p of x equals one. If a probability distribution p of x does exist and it is independent of time, then the distribution is said to be stationary. Okay? More will be said a little later on this, but if those of you who already have had uh, some preparation, what we mean by a stationary distribution in theoretically proper terms would be that to say that all the, as we collect more and more data to construct our distri probability distribution, it is going to go through some uh, uh, early, uh, how do you put it? It's going to fluctuate a lot before it settles down to some, uh, uh, some asymptotic form that no longer depends upon the, um, the number of data points that went into constructing the distribution. Another way of stating the same is that the moments of the distribution become independent of the total number of data points used to construct the distribution. But in practical terms, as an experimentalist, I can tell you that is not possible for us. We always deal with finite amount of data. So a weak form of that stationarity requirement is that if the first two or the first four moments at best can converge, then we say, okay, it is stationary. So this is the hand-waving part that comes in the experimental side of things, okay? So since I've already used the term moments, let's go ahead and define it, okay? So can you, yeah, the board is still visible. So maybe I will use this part of the board separately. So now for the moments of a distribution. The moments of a distribution are the expectation values of the powers of the observable x to the power n. So the moments of a distribution defined so where we all know the first moment which is the average or the mean x times p of x dx. And the mean square deviation from this is the variance. So mean square deviation or the variance which we typically designate by sigma squared equals and if we do simple algebra we know that x squared minus, sorry, plus and that is the same as no, sorry, uh, this is inside, this is outside, right? And that gives us okay. The square root of this variance is what we know as so square root of variance is what we know as the standard deviation. Sigma. So the probability distribution contains no information about the time varying properties, the temporal properties of the observed quantity. A useful probe of this is the auto covariance function. So this is the basic set of information I will stop with about the distribution and random variables and moments. We will come back to it because I want to cover the time varying properties a little bit.
So, the auto covariance function is defined as x of t, x of t minus tau, which is in the limit that capital T goes to infinity, 1 over t from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2, x of t, x of t minus tau, d tau. If we normalize the autocovariance function by the variance, then we call it the autocorrelation function, ranging from plus 1. So, if autocovar function normalized by sigma squared, we call it the autocorrelation function. The range of the autocorrelation function is plus 1 for perfect correlation minus 1 for perfect anticorrelation and 0 for no correlation at all. So, a physical interpretation of an autocorrelation function is that if I give you some signal x of t that is for simplicity I will assume that it has 0 mean and it is fluctuating about the value 0 and this is time and if I break it up into windows of time tau. and ask how much of the signal at time t plus tau uh, does, uh, does this value, if I, if I make a measurement at time t, how much of its past does it remember? So, the autocorrelation function is in some ways quantifying how much memory there is in a, in, in a process that you are, in a, in a signal that you are measuring. Another way of thinking about it is uh, how much information do I have in a given signal to anticipate the current value given the past history. So, a simple way of looking at it is in the old days we used to have these uh, uh, slide projectors and if you were to take two exact copies of the signal and make them coincidental and slide one uh, signal over the other, you can sort of see how the signal, how fast the signal is changing its values. So, if you have a perf completely random process where where the current value has nothing to do with its previous value, then the correlation is completely zero. But suppose you have a sine wave where you can sort of predict what value uh, it is going to take at any given instant, then you can say something about the signal at least half the time. All right. So, the rate at which the autocorrelation function decays as a function of the time tau, the time window I have chosen, tau provides one way to determine how quickly a function is varying. Another way as I said is to look at it, look at it is to say the autocorrelation function provides a quantitative estimate of the memory in a given signal on average. Very soon we will introduce the concept of mutual information in uh, not tomorrow's but uh, later lecture and a much more general way to measure the relationships between or uh, among variables. Now that we have the autocorrelation function, you notice that this is a time domain uh, quantity. Let us get into spectral theorems and compare its uh, reciprocal equivalent, which uh, some of you may know well as the power spectrum. So, I can just erase this part and continue. If I give you a fluctuating quantity x of t, then the Fourier transform of this. Excuse me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have two questions yeah. here about the correlation. Yeah. 
Uh, if I uh, uh, draw the, the uh, uh, autocorrelation based on tau, uh, uh, if the behavior be power law, what's the meaning of the, this power law behavior of autocorrelation by tau? Okay, you are running ahead of the lecture, so we will come to it. If if you if if you are patient for a little bit, uh, we will touch upon it. Okay, thank you. Sorry. But uh, to quickly give you a, a hand-waving answer, if uh, the autocorrelation function decays as a power law, it, uh, is there a general statement I can make? I, I don't know. Uh, Matteo, Sydney, there is no general remark we can make if the auto... Uh, is it about criticality? Mm. Criticality of the time series? Uh, hello. So I, I think you can get um, uh, you can think of a power law uh, decay as a superposition of many exponential uh, decays uh, with different time scales. So that in some sense, uh, power law would be like uh, a normal decay, exponential decay with many many time scales. So with um, uh, time scale invariance if you want. So in this sense, you could think uh, it as, as critical. Another issue is whether uh, the autocorrelation can be integrated. Uh, uh, so whether the integral of the autocorrelation function is finite. In that case, you don't have a system with memory. In the other case, uh, if it is infinite, it means that it has infinite memory. But I think uh, Maesh will come to that. Uh, excuse me, uh, another question. I think it's also uh, going through. But uh, what about the uh, uh, oscillating and the decreasing and, and oscillating decreasing behavior? Like. Uh, uh, oscillate and. Do you mean a signal that is oscillating but the oscillation magnitude is decreasing as yes, time goes? Yes, yes, yes. You would have, uh, so I can think of this more naturally in the spectral domain, which I haven't come to yet, but it would mean that you have a peak at a particular frequency, uh, which is with, with a window that is broadening. Uh, in the, the autocorrelation function of that would be basically a signal that oscillates, uh, yeah, the, co the correlation function at short time scales will show the oscillatory behavior, but eventually it will go to zero. If, if I have a perfect sine wave, for instance, that is never uh, decaying, uh, that is uh, stationary uh, in the sense that you don't have any decaying process in it, then the, aut the autocorrelation function can be analytically uh, figured out and it will always go and uh, oscillate about uh, the 2 pi uh, cycle. But if, if, if I include a decay component to, onto the sine wave, then uh, at some point, the autocorrelation must decay to zero, but there will be oscillatory aspect uh, component to the uh, the correlation function in the beginning. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. All right. So let us um, a bit. Uh, okay. Yes. It's okay. So let's move to spectral theorems now. Uh, so if we have the quantity x of t and we want to define the Fourier transform of this fluctuating quantity, that would, I will use the, uh, the terminology capital X of F for frequency in the limit time t going to infinity, the integral minus t over 2 to plus t over 2, e to the i 2 pi F t x of t dt. And since we have the Fourier transform, let me also go ahead and state the inverse Fourier transform of this. Which would be x of t equals the limit that the f bandwidth frequency f goes to infinity from minus f over 2 to plus f over 2 in the window e to the minus i 2 pi f t x of f 
d f. So, the Fourier transform is also a random variable and the power spectral density which I will define now, the power spectral density. Usually, we just call it the power spectrum or PSD is defined in terms of the Fourier transform by taking the average value of the square magnitude of the transform. So, any question? So, the Fourier transform, uh, the power spectral density is S of f equals squared, which is x of f and x star, the complex conjugate of f, which I don't know if we can see this. Yeah, it is visible. Okay. I'll just go down. It's easier that way. The limit that time goes to infinity. second integral minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 e to minus i to pi f t prime x of t prime d t prime. Okay, so once again x star here is the complex conjugate of x. So, replacing i with minus i and we shall assume that x is real, the small x that this signal x of t. Oh, yeah. Right here. And I, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, a few words about the power spectrum itself. The power spectrum might not have a well-defined limit for a non-stationary process. Uh, examples of that you may have heard of are wavelets uh, and Wigner functions which are also examples of time frequency transforms. They retain both temporal and spectral information for non-stationary signals. Uh, one example where we come across this is uh, in biological sciences. One example I know because I worked on it few years ago uh, is uh, bird song. When you are trying to analyze bird song, you take a spectrogram where you have to look at both the time domain as well as the frequency domain uh, signals. So, uh, there are areas where Fourier transforms are not very useful, but uh, in most in most cases in physical sciences at least they, we, they, they provide a lot of inform useful information for us to work with. Okay. So, continuing on. I see the advantage I enjoy, Sydney, because I get to keep the right half while I'm erasing the left part and tomorrow we'll be able to do better. <laughs> All right. So, the Fourier transform, you will note, is always defined for negative as well as positive frequencies. If the sign of the frequency is changed, the imaginary or the sign component of the complex exponential changes the sign, while the real or the cosine part does not change the sign. Okay. For a real valued signal, this means that the transform for negative frequencies is equal to the complex conjugate of the transform for the positive frequencies. Since the power spectrum is used to measure energy as a function of frequency, it is usually reported as a single sided power spectrum, that is we disregard the negative frequency part. It is usually reported as a single sided power spectral density found by adding the square magnitudes of the negative and positive frequency components. For a real signal, these are identical and so the single sided density differs from the two sided density by an occasionally omitted factor of 2. The Fourier transform can also be defined with the 2 pi in front. So, then we do not use the symbol f, instead we use the angular frequency symbol omega, which would be in the limit t going to infinity. Uh, we have 
minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 e to the i omega t x of t dt and x, the inverse transform x of t is in the limit that capital omega goes to infinity 1 over 2 pi integral minus omega over 2 to plus capital omega over 2 e to the minus i omega t x of omega d omega. So, as you can see I am mostly covering the nomenclature and the terminology taking care of the definitions. So, the symbol nu measures frequency in cycles per second. Omega measures frequency in radians per second. Because 2 pi radians is one cycle. So, defining the transform in terms of nu eliminates errors that arise from forgetting to include 2 pi in the inverse transform or in converting from radians to cycle per cycles per second. So, I have a habit of working with nu because I am a very forgetful fellow. In fact, the joke when I landed a professor's job was he is already absent minded now he is also a professor. <laughs> anyway, so as I said uh, defining the transform in terms of nu eliminates errors that arise from forgetting to include the 2 pi. So, it is it's just a factor of keeping track of the 2 pi, ok. We will use whichever is convenient for a given problem. The power spectrum is simply related to the autocorrelation function we saw in the time domain a bit earlier through the wiener kinchin theorem found by taking the inverse transform of the power spectrum. So, I will just show you the quick calculation. This is one of my favorite theorems in all of physics, the wiener kinchin theorem because very often I find myself not knowing what to do. I reach a certain point in a problem and I do not know what to do. So, I when I do not know what to do I just take the Fourier transform and so, sometimes it works. Actually it, it has worked more often than I can believe it. So, let me because this will take some space. Okay, so The theorem I am referring to is the Wiener Kinchin theorem. It is named after Norbert Wiener, the famous professor from MIT, the father of cybernetics. If you ever get a chance, actually read a beautiful book by him called God and Golem Incorporated. It is a very beautiful uh, book. Uh, and Kinchin, of course, Alexa Alexander Kinchin, who, who did a lot of work in probability theory together with Kolmogorov. So, as I said the power spectrum is simply related to the autocorrelation function through this theorem and so let us see. So, if we start by integrating the power spectrum which we defined as S of f and we take the inverse Fourier transform of it. So, we should be taking minus 2 pi f t d f this is basically and the complex conjugate times e to the minus i 2 pi f t d f. So, I am just expanding the power spectrum and now we will start working with each term. So, this gives us in the limit of t going to infinity 1 over t minus infinity to plus infinity and then minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 So, you can see that I have basically expanded these two terms out 
And once we do, and I have to add one more term because I forgot this. So I'll just add it here below, minus I2 pi FT DF. So we have three integrals. We have three DT, DT prime DF, good. So now, yes, I keep forgetting the average throughout. So <laughs> actually I forgot to put the average throughout over here. So we have the limit t going to infinity, 1 over t from minus infinity to plus infinity and now we can take the terms together. Sorry, Professor. Yeah. I don't understand the one over t in front of the limit. Sorry. The one over t. Yeah. Okay. Why there's now a one over t and before there there isn't? There is. You're saying there's no one over t over here, but now I have added one over t. Yeah. Uh, in the previous uh, definitions. Oh, did. In definition of oh, the Fourier transform. Let's see. You're right. I forgot the one over T there. That is the right answer. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for catching it. As you can see, I'm an experimental theorist, not a theoretical experimentalist. <laughs> I'm still experimenting with theory. Okay, let's proceed. So, yeah. where is the one over T? Is in, uh, no, no, in the definition of X of F? Yeah. Uh, okay. Just in the Fourier transform and not in the anti-Fourier transform. Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay, so now we club the terms in the exponentials and I'm going to just write it as T minus T prime minus tau DF X of T X of T prime DT DT prime. And this time I won't forget the angular brackets. And proceeding through and doing this integral, we can basically write the exponential now as the limit t going to infinity, 1 over t. We have, we solve 1 for the first integral and we just go with minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 and Now this is the delta function. So I can write this as the, so today morning uh, Sydney introduced the Kronecker delta. I am introducing its co a continuous counterpart, the Dirac delta function. So you can think of a Dirac delta function as a Gaussian distribution with z in the limit that the standard deviation is going to zero. That is one definition. It's not the only definition of a Dirac delta function. But I'll, I'll tell you what it means shortly. So we get t minus t prime minus tau x of t x of t prime dt dt prime. Okay, and now we can write when we integrate the Dirac delta function, we basically get instead of t prime, uh, is it one moment? Uh, let me first write down this, and then I'll explain it. It's uh, it's difficult for me to follow both at the same time. So what I have done here is I have solved one integral using the Dirac delta function and it has the property that if I take, uh, for instance, it has the property that if I have, I should take some other value, x minus x zero, then it takes the given value at that interval, uh, it takes the value x zero at, at the given point. So here I can replace t prime by t minus tau for that reason, 
because I'm solving for the integral against dt prime. So that leaves me with only one integral and that is the same as x of t, x of t minus tau average which was the autocovariance function we saw without, if I give the normalization then I get the autocorrelation function. So here, so now I can explain to you what I meant by the Dirac delta function. So the Fourier transform of a delta function is what I used. Can people see it there? Yeah. So this is the identity I have used. So as I said, one way to derive these relations is by taking the delta function to be the limit of a Gaussian with unit norm as its variance goes to zero. So the wiener kinchin theorem shows that the Fourier transform of the autocovariance function gives the power spectrum. So knowledge of one is deemed to be equivalent to the other. The wiener kinchin and one, one important example of this is white noise. A memoryless process with a delta function autocorrelation will have a flat spectrum regardless of the probability distribution for the signal. As the autocorrelation function decays more slowly, the power spectrum decays more quickly. I have included a figure in my lecture notes, so uh, it's difficult for me to show here, but let me try, yeah, maybe I'll bring it closer. Can you folks see that? So, Unfortunately, I cannot see what I am showing you. So, if you have a time, actually, let me come closer. No, we'll just, stay there no, we'll just do it this way. So, what I am trying to show you here is I have a time series, I have a spectrum, and I have its autocorrelation function. So, the first case is an illustration of the Wiener. This is basically what I am trying to show by plotting different time series and what kind of spectra you get from there and what kind of correlation functions you get for them. So here you have a completely random time series for which I have a completely flat spectrum and the autocorrelation function decays quickly and is, is going to zero. Whereas if I have a much more complicated signal, the spectrum starts decaying quite slowly and if I plot the autocorrelation function, it takes a long time. That means this, this kind of signal has much longer memory and this is an um, even stronger case where the the, uh, ah, yes, thank you. So here, the autocorrelation function decays even more slowly. So uh, it takes much longer time to decay, whereas if you look at the spectrum, it is decaying faster. So the, you get the same information in, in uh, whether you're looking at the power spectrum or the autocorrelation function from, from an experimental or an engineer's point of view. Uh, there is not much of a difference between whether you look at the spectrum or the correlation function, but from a theoretical point of view, many a time it is easier to work with the correlation function. In other cases, it is much easier to do work in the spectral domain, okay? So, but if you, if you download the scan of the lecture notes, you will, uh, you can see this figure more, more uh, prominently, so it will give you a better idea. Yes. Okay, so now one aside that I want to point out, and I think I can erase this part, is about the Wiener Kinchin theorem and how it is related to another mathematical result we know. If I take taking the time tau equal to zero, so if I take tau equal to zero, that means I I have instantaneous correlation, right? And autocorrelation will always be one because the signal is always completely self-correlated with, it, with itself at that very time instant. But if I take tau equals zero, the wiener kinchin theorem
yields what we know as the Parseval's theorem. So let's do that quickly. X of t, x of t minus tau S of f, and I am working in the spectral domain now, minus i 2 pi, so f of t df, and that gives me integral oh, let me write it in the next line. implies that that and that is basically the Parseval's theorem that is coming out of the wiener Kinchin theorem when I set the time window to 0, tau to 0. The <coughs> excuse me. Oops. Sorry about that. So the average value of the square of the signal which is equal to the variance if the signal has zero mean is equal to the integral of the power spectral density. This means that true white noise has an infinite variance in the time domain although the finite bandwidth of any real system will roll off the frequency response and hence determine the variance of the measured signal. So I have, I have said something that an experimentalist understands quite well usually because in the real world we don't have anything as real white noise, true white noise. So if you were to work with a function generator and we say I am feeding you white noise, the function generator ha always has a finite bandwidth, maybe 15 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, what have you. So we are always approximating white noise within some frequency range. So what I have just said tantamount is tantamount to saying that even though real white noise has uh, uh, infinite variance. In the, real, in the real world case, where because of the finiteness of the bandwidth of any physical system we are working with, we are always going to see finite frequency response and then there will be a roll off of the frequency response. So that, that sets the limits on the variance of the signal. If the division by time capital T is left off in the limiting process as I did earlier, uh, defining the averages on both sides of the Parseval's theorem, then it reads that the total energy in the signal equals the total energy in the spectrum. So the integral of the square of the magnitude, that is what it means. So that is what I wanted to share with you about spectral theorems. So we saw uh, the definition of the autocovariance function and normalizing it we get the autocorrelation function and we saw that the autocovariance function is uh, equivalent to the power spectral density in the information that it represents and the relation comes to us through the wiener kinchin theorem. So now we will go back to probability distribution. So as we started with random variables, we looked at a little bit of the time variance uh, of the signals, time uh, variation of the signals and now we go into the probability distributions. So this is mostly uh, uh, the pedagogical part of the or the conceptual part where I am building the basic uh, fundamentals. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I have a doubt before we go on. Sure. Um, 
in each step of the Wiener Kinchin derivation, you kept the uh, expectation value symbol. Yes. But shouldn't uh, you drop it when you when you wrote uh, the limit that t go that goes to infinity on one over t? You mean because uh, that here? yeah because I think that is a definition of the expectation value as you uh, gave gave it to us. Yes. Before. Yes. And that's where the one over t come from, not from the Fourier transform. Agreed. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So. Let's proceed to probability distributions. How are we doing on the time? Are we okay? Yeah, we have plenty of time. All right, so we start with probability distributions. I think we can zip through this a bit quickly because it's quite likely most of you have seen the elementary distributions, but I'm just covering it so that we are all on the same page with respect to terminology. So, so far we have taken the probability distribution P of X to be arbitrary. I haven't said anything about its functional form. In practice, three probability distributions, so we, we said nothing about functional form. In practice, three probability distributions recur so frequently that they receive most attention and they are the binomial Poisson and the Gaussian. Their popularity is due in equal parts to the common conditions that give rise to them and to the convenience of working with them. The latter reason sometimes outweighs the former. We, many of us tend to use them because they are convenient to use, not because they are relevant to the problem, uh, but they are a good starting point to work with most often. So as I said, the latter reason sometimes outweigh the former and for that reason uh, these distributions are employed far, uh, far from where they usually apply. For example, many physical systems, particularly those driven strongly far away from thermal equilibrium where very non-linear responses abide, have long tail distributions that fall off much more slowly than the, uh, than these three distributions do. We will look at a class of these long tail distributions, namely power law tail distributions later on. So let's start with the binomial distribution. So if I consider many trials of an event that can have one outcome with a probability P, so binomial, We have many trials of an event that has outcome with probability P. Such as flipping a coin or seeing and, and seeing a head and an alternative with probability 1 minus P such as seeing a tail. In n trials, so if I have n trials, the probability p sub n of x to see x heads and n minus x tails independent of the particular order in which they were seen is found by adding up the probability for each outcome times the number of equivalent arrangements, which we write as P sub N of X equals N, choose X, P to the X times 1 minus P 
to the n minus x, where can is this visible? Yeah, where is n factorial divided by n minus x factorial times x factorial. So this sim this notation is ref usually referred to as n choose x. So this is the binomial distribution. The second line follows by dividing the total number of distinct arrangements of n objects, n factorial, by the number of equivalent distinct arrangements of heads, which is x factorial, and tails, which is n minus x factorial. The easiest way to convince yourself that this is correct is to exhaustively count the possibilities for a small case. Small case because you will see a combinatorial blow up if you start increasing the number of uh, the number n. Then we go to the Poisson distribution. So now let us consider events such as radioactive decays that occur randomly in time. Dividing time into n very small intervals so that either there are no decays or one decay in any one given interval. So we have chosen a time window such that there is at most one decay in that given time window or no decay. And let p be the probability of seeing a decay in an interval. If the total number of events that occur in a given time is recorded and this is repeated many times to form an ensemble of measurements, then the distribution of the total number of events recorded will be given by the binomial distribution. If the number intervals n is large, then and the probability and the probability p is small. The binomial distribution can be approximated, the binomial distribution can be approximated using Stirling's approximation for large n which says n factorial is approximately equal to square root of 2 pi times n to the n plus n to the power n plus half e to the minus n which means if i take log n factorial will approximately go as n log n minus n. So this gives us the, the Poisson distribution I am not plugging in this approximation into the binomial to show you, you can work it out as, a, as an exercise but it is quite likely you have already worked it out during your uh, uh, earlier preparation in uh, elementary uh, stat mech. This gives us e to the minus n, n to the x divided by x factorial where I have now introduced capital N and capital N is small n times p is the average number of events. So, let's see. The Poisson distribution is very common for measurements that require counting independent measurements of an, any given event. So naturally it is normalized. So the normalization for 
the song is is equal to 0 to infinity e to the minus n to the power x over x factorial is e to the minus n times summation x equals 0 to infinity n to the power x over x factorial which is e to the power plus n. So, therefore, this is equal to 1. If x is drawn from a Poisson distribution, then its factorial moments, sorry, its, its factorial moments defined by the following equation have a simple form x times x minus 1 and so on to x minus m plus 1 is n to the power m. This relationship is in fact one of the benefits of using the Poisson approximation. With it, it is easy to show that the expectation of the variable x is equal to n and its standard deviation sigma is square root of n, which in turn implies that the relative standard deviation in a Poisson random variable is 1 over square root of n. So, the fractional error in an estimate of the average value will decrease as the square root. This is something we very routinely work with when doing experiments and we ask what is the error in our measurement. And if we can assume that the measurements are coming, are, are, are drawn independently, then we can say it goes as 1 over square root of n. So, I'll, let me give you one example where people make this assumption and, and it is erroneous. So, uh, few years ago, I was working on fluctuations in wind power and uh, there is an influential uh, 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 researcher who wrote a scientific American article explaining that, okay, so the, the problem in, with wind power is that uh, you have atmospheric turbulence and so if the turbine is generating power from the uh, wind blowing past the turbine, the turbine equation says that the power generated goes as wind speed cubed. So, if the wind speed is fluctuating, then power is also fluctuating because wind speed cube will also vary. And so, that in fact, the fluctuations are getting magnified. So, the electrical grid was not designed to deal with this. The electrical grid we have today was designed to deal with uh, constant power generation that comes from, say, coal-fired or nuclear power plant, which are high inertia systems. So, the question in the renewable energy community is, how do we deal with uh, fluctuating input into the power grid and what are the robustness parameters that we must design the future smart grid for to deal with these fluctuations. In order to do so, you have to understand the character of these fluctuations. So, there was an influential scholar who wrote a scientific American article saying the wind is always blowing somewhere, so let's just interconnect all of the wind turbines and wind farms and we are fine. At, they'll average as 1 over square root of n and it, at, at some limit, at some large wind turbine, uh, uh, number of wind turbines, we will get a perfectly DC signal. The problem is there are correlations in the atmospheric flows and they correlate the wind turbines and the, fluctuate, the, the fluctuations in the power output. So, we cannot make such a simple assumption. So, but his assumption was coming from the fact that the, as, as he starts summing the number of the outputs from several wind turbines, the assumption he made was that they are independent producers of power, that they are not correlated. And so, he, he used the 1 over square root of n as his uh, uh, yardstick and went, went and did his calculations. So, this is a common pitfall. Sorry, a question? Was there any question? Okay. So, this is one example uh, where we tend to take 1 over square root of n for granted, but if, if, if the fundamental, uh, if the underlying process is not drawn from an independent uh, measurement, then it, it does not work for us. So, let us see, we have the fraction, yeah. So, the, I told you the fractional error in an estimate of the average value will decrease as the square root of the number of samples. This important result provides a good way to make a quick estimate of the expected error in a counting experiment. And I gave you one example where it fails miserably. In fact, it is possible to show uh, by doing scaling techniques that 
there is, if you combine the output of wind power from several turbines and several geographically distributed wind farms, there is actually a correlation length that is set by the atmospheric turbulence of around hundreds of kilometers. And if you average all of them, the, there is a limit to how much you can smooth these fluctuations. These fluctuations will smooth up to a limit and then they will halt. You have to come up with other engineered mechanisms to deal with them. So here, that, that's one example where a Poisson process doesn't help us. So we'll go to the third distribution now. I'm doing fine on time. And I think this is a distribution you all are quite familiar with, which is the famous Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian or the normal distribution or normal. Excuse me. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, when you talk about uh, wind turb turbines, yeah. What is the quantity that is modeled as the random variable distributed as the Poisson? What, what is the quantity? The total power. So you have it. So let us stop for a moment. All of you know about the Gaussian, but I don't know how many of you know about wind turbines. So if you have a wind turbine and you have wind blowing past it to turn the rotor and generate power. This is a relation that it's a dimensional argument that goes all the way back to Rankine of Rankine numbers and all that the power generated by the wind turbine is less than or equal to 16 over 27 times one half rho A V cubed where 16 over 27 is the theoretical upper limit on the amount of energy, kinetic energy available in the wind that can be extracted, or and, uh, the total amount of power available in the wind that can be extracted by the turbine. Rho is the density of air. A is the cross-sectional area of the rotor. And V is the velocity, okay? So it is possible, this is a dimensional argument. If I forget, if I take all of this into one, I can write a time dependent form of this equation that this part I'll just call K, K times V of T cubed. So basically, the power generated by a wind turbine goes as the wind speed cubed. So if the velocity is fluctuating due to unsteady flows of the atmospheric turbulence, then the power will also fluctuate and it will fluctuate as a cubic function. Now, if I have, say, in a, I, if I start summing, so if I, let's say I have a geographical area spanning some hundreds of kilometers of radius <coughs> and I have several wind farms within it, each with several turbines. And I'm going to sum all of these guys, the power from all, all turbines within the wind farm. And I'm going to sum the power output from all of these wind farms at the grid level. So the question is, each turbine is outputting a fluctuating quantity. And I'm summing all those fluctuating signals at the farm level and I'm taking many such geographically distributed farms and I'm summing all their power outputs at the grid. What are the fluctuations I see at the grid level? This equation, or rather this relation, is for the single turbine. But I could always come up with summation over I equal to 1 to N, J equal 1 to M, P sub I J of T, goes as basically Vij of T cubed, where I am dealing with the ith wind farm, where I have total of n wind farms, and within the ith wind farm, I have j turbines going that range from 1 to m. So 
I can deal with sum over all of these and I ask how is this quantity fluctuating now. The fluctuations of this combined quantity are different from the fluctuations of the individual turbine. So the question is how is the smoothing taking place? If I assume that each of these turbines is an independent uh, producer of power, that the fluctuations of one turbine have absolutely nothing to do with the fluctuations of another turbine, then I can go as 1 over square root of, I can't use capital N anymore, but basically N plus M as how the fluctuations smooth out. But you never see it that way. So that was the example I was giving you where this fails completely. Did that long answer explain your short question? Yeah, more or less, I think, yeah. Good. If you're interested, please drop me a mail. I'll, I'll send you the, the paper. So just for your reference, you can just drop me a mail here and I can send you the material. Okay? Okay, thanks. In, there are lots of questions actually you will you will be surprised. Ren every form of renewable energy fluctuates because of the natural variability in its ener energy source. There, so there is a statistical physical framework waiting to be formulated for fluctuations in renewable energy that has not taken place yet. Why? Because the engineers and the policy makers who work on renewable energy systems have not studied statistical physics, but when it comes to fluctuations, statistical physics is the natural home for any principal study of fluctuations. So I think there is an opportunity for STATMEC community to make a big dent over there and dynamical systems community too. Okay, let's get back to Gaussians. So I can write down the Gaussian distribution for you first and then we will look at its properties. The functional form is 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu whole, whole squared over 2 sigma squared. Okay, I'm almost out of this chalk. Remind me to tell you a story about the chalk I'm using today. at the very end of this lecture. I will even send you a link to a very nice video involving mathematicians in this talk. <laughs> okay. So the Gaussian distribution with this functional form has a mean mu and standard deviation sigma and the integral form and the integral form from minus infinity to plus infinity is 1, so that it's all properly normalized. The partial integral of a Gaussian of a Gaussian is an error function. which we write as integral 0 to some upper bound y e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared dx equals 1 over 2 erf of y over square root of 2 sigma squared. And since the Gaussian is normalized, have the error function for infinity equals 1. 
The Gaussian distribution is common for many reasons and it is quite likely most of you already know this. One way to derive it is from an expression around the peak of the binomial distribution for very large n. So if I take So if I take P of x equals n factorial divided by n minus x factorial times x factorial p to the power x 1 minus p to the power n minus x and take log p of x equals log n factorial minus log n minus x factorial plus x log p plus n minus x log 1 minus p. Is that correct? n factorial minus n minus x. I think I forgot something. Oh, minus, I forgot. I'll just put it here. Okay. So finding the peak by treating these large integers as continuous variables and setting the first derivative to 0 shows that this has a maximum at x approximately equal to n times p. And then expanding in a power series around the maximum gives the coefficient of the quadratic term quadratic term to be minus 1 over 2 n p times 1 minus p. Because the lowest non-zero term will dominate the higher order for higher orders for large n, this is therefore approximately a Gaussian with mean n p and variance n p times 1 minus p. In the next section, we will also see that the Gaussian distribution emerges through the central limit theorem and that is the more conventional form, that, that the better known form as the limiting form for an ensemble of variables with almost any distribution. So for these reasons, it is often safe and certainly common to assume that an unknown distribution is Gaussian. Just as I said, when I don't know what to do, I take a Fourier transform. <laughs> I think it is safe to uh, begin with when you don't know what functional form a distribution has, it is safe to start with a Gaussian distribution. So let me give you a real world example here. If I'm not an expert in control theory, but uh, within the community of mechanical engineering and uh, those who study applied dynamical systems, uh, control theory is a very well studied subject and it is of uh, great interest in many of these auto automation problems, especially these days with quadrocopters and drones and uh, uh, robots and whatnot. Uh, in fact, it's quite likely that most of you in the audience have uh, purchased uh, stuff from Amazon. And if you have, then it is very likely that you have uh, in some way or the other received your package through such a control system, uh, automated control system that was originally designed by Kiva Systems, which was bought out by Amazon Robotics later. The a sub, a sub class of control theory, what is known as stochastic control theory or per, uh, robust control theory, deals with problems where you have perturbations that you cannot uh, uh, describe, that, that, you have, that you do not have, that you cannot anticipate. And typically what they do is they assume that the distribution is Gaussian. Now let me point out a problem that is unsolved. And I'm actually doing an ex designing an experiment to point this out. You have a drone, a quadrocopter, and it is going about in an unsteady environment. The requirement for an engineer, uh, either due to policy uh, uh, imperatives or uh, their own, uh, uh, the, in the interest of self-preservation, they either want to say, go for fuel efficiency or they want to go for safety or both. So it's a question of what, what, what issue you're optimizing for. So you have to 
provide a control system, design a control system for your drone or your quadricopter that may be delivering pizza or maybe uh, 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 medicines in the middle of the Sahara Desert where uh, normal uh, transport doesn't work. So in these mission critical processes, you have to design a control system. There are two ways to deal with uh, this uh, drone going through an unsteady flow medium. One is you either oversample it at very, very high frequencies and basically make it piecewise linear and do uh, the normal control problem or you get some information about the unsteady flow that your, your, the drone is being subjected to and try to anticipate what is coming. So typically the kind of unsteadiness that they put into their uh, mechanism is a Gaussian uh, fluctuation. But I can show you that it is impossible for this distribution to be Gaussian. Hopefully we, hopefully we will be able to reach lecture nine where I will actually show you the, the functional form. I can, I can trace out the, the kind of distribution you will see. Most of you have seen the Gaussian distribution. It looks like this. If you have X and P of X, the famous bell curve. If, I, if you ask yourself the following question, let's say I have a random variable capital Z, which is constructed from the product of two other random variables. And if I say that the random variables X and Y are normally distributed, then what is the functional form of the distribution Z? The reason I'm asking this general question is when you're dealing with power, power of any form, it is always a product of some quantity. If I'm talking about electrical power, P is I squared R or V squared over R, where V is the voltage and I is the current. So it's a product. If my current is fluctuating, uh, in a, uh, fluctuating with a Gaussian distribution, then it's a product of two Gaussian distributions. Or if the voltage has a Gaussian uh, uh, fluctuating form, then it's a product. Or in case of wind power that we saw, where it goes as V cubed, we know in turbulence theory that the velocity fluctuations are always almost Gaussian distributed. Differences in velocity which we study extensively in turbulence theory are not Gaussian distributed. But what is the distribution of V cubed? These distributions are not Gaussian. They usually have this form. They have fat tails and very pointed cusps. This is nowhere near Gaussian. So the question then is, can I come up with a general form for the kind of distribution I expect to see for a random variable Z that is constructed from the product of normally distributed random variables? That is a, that is a question that can be answered from statistics and from statistical mechanics. But when you come to robust control theory, they assume that they, they are looking at power which couldn't possibly have a Gaussian distribution. But because they can solve for a Gaussian problem, they assume it is a Gaussian proceed with it. But it doesn't work. So what do they do at the end of the day? They oversample their system and try to f work out through piecewise linear control fits. As a result, the battery bleeds very quickly and you lose your gain. So these are real world problems where all these uh, concepts that we learn kick in. And these are problems waiting to be solved. Anybody who cracks this problem is going to be a multimillionaire. Okay, so. Where was I before I broke into robust control? Yeah, the central limit theorem, yeah. And for these reasons, it is often safe and certainly common to assume that an unknown distribution is Gaussian, but I gave you a counter example. And if, as I said, if you solve this, you're going to make a lot of money. The Fourier transform of, of a Gaussian distribution has a particularly simple form, namely the, a Gaussian with the inverse of the variance. So here are some of the nice properties of a Gaussian which make it so attractive. <coughs> Sorry, just uh, one really yeah. small question. Yeah. Can you repeat? Exactly. What is the state, the the problem to be solved to get the the to become a multimillionaire? So, <laughs> so suddenly everybody woke up. Okay. So. No, no. I mean, I I, I followed uh, along, but um, I didn't really understood the the precise uh, problem. Uh, yeah. Like right. So Thank first, you. go and study control theory. Step one. 
then go and specialize in robust control theory or stochastic control theory. Within robust, con so robust control theory deals with a system, how to control a system that is subjected to external perturbations or fluctuations. We may know some information about those fluctuations, but we not, may not know much. In the general case, we have to assume in the real world uh, system where a drone or a, any other system has to work in any number of hostile env environments, it is impossible to predict all the possible environments and fluctuations that the system is going to be subjected to. So there is a certain robustness criteria that goes into designing the system. So in the robustness, ro in the robust control theory, when they want to assume the kind of perturbations that the system is going to be subjected to, they take in, they assume that the fluctuations that the system is being subjected to is Gaussian. So the inputs that go are the mean and the standard deviation. But most of these systems that they are dealing with are dealing with a fluctuating quantity which is a power. But power, I can guarantee you, could never possibly have a Gaussian distribution in most cases because it is always constructed from product of random variables. So if I have power, as I said, electrical power is V squared over R or I squared R, mechanical power is, in, in the case of a quadrocopter, mechanical power can be de uh, defined as mechanical, sorry, P sub electrical, P sub mechanical uh, would be the torque times the RPM, re revolutions per minute of the propellers or the mechanic, uh, the power coming from the unsteady medium which will also, go, which will go as velocity cubed. You have three different definitions of power. All three are definitely related to each other, but what you notice, a common feature is the power is always a product of fluctuating quantities. So if instead of V, the voltage, I write it as a time varying quantity because the voltage will always have fluctuations. If I assume this voltage is normally, the fluctuations in the voltage are normally distributed, then the product of a normally distributed quantity with itself couldn't possibly give you a Gaussian distribution again. That was my point. So what is the functional form of some random variable Z that is constructed from the product of random, uh, normally distributed variables. You solve that problem, you're doing good. That, did, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yes, but like for two, for two identical Gaussian distributions, uh, do we get uh, a key distribution? I haven't, I haven't said this problem is answered, so I can't answer your question. Okay, okay. So if, if I had answered, if I had answered this, I, I would be a multimillionaire already. Okay, okay. I, but I'm just a lowly academic. <laughs> okay, so I'm about to enter. Okay, so we will stop in a bit. Again, drop me a line and I can send you details about the, about the problem. These are, these are a bunch of problems I write in my notebook and I keep and sometimes I get some idea when I'm sitting in a talk and I ask how does this bear upon this question that I had noted down because I don't know the answers to all the questions I have written down. Okay, so as I said, the Fourier transform of a Gaussian has a simple form which is basically a Gaussian with the inverse of the variance. So I have 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared integral minus infinity to plus infinity e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared e to the i k x dx is e to the minus k squared sigma squared over 2. Remember this, you should never need to look up the transform of a Gaussian just invert the variance, you're done. The variance. Because of this relationship, the product of variance of a Gaussian and the variance of its Fourier transform will be a constant. Was there any question? Okay. So the product of the variance of a Gaussian and the variance of its Fourier transform will be a constant. This is the origin of many classical and quantum uncertainty relationships. 
So let me stop there today because the next topic I wanted to touch upon was to introduce the central limit theorem in very simple terms uh, because we are almost, yeah, it's 3.59. So maybe we should stop there because I won't be able to finish this. So we will continue with the central limit theorem tomorrow. So any questions, please? Questions? Of course, we want to know the story of the chalk. Ah, yes. So this chalk, it's a Japanese chalk called Hagoromo. And I came across it from a YouTube video. I'll post the link. Uh, I don't know if, is there some way to send the link to all the students? Yeah. Send so, it to Erika. Yeah, I'll, I'll send the link of a video to er Erika and she will share it, share it with all of you. But so the Japanese we mathematicians were using this chalk, Hagaro, or just run a search. Right, we don't need Erika to send you a link. Look for Hagoromo. and mathematics and you will find the video and you know the rest of the story. So I come from an institute that does not have blackboards anymore. So I bought this chalk and I have traveled all the way from Japan to Italy to try it out. And I can tell you it's a really good chalk. <laughs> Actually, I have one more person to, to confirm it for me. Sydney used it today morning and he was very happy with it. Too. So if you want to find out what is good about it, you can, I don't know if ICTP rules will now permit them to come here and try it out one after the other, but we'll, we'll think of some way. All right, with that, let's stop. But yeah, that was one question I answered about the chalk. Any other questions? You will have noticed that the conceptual material I'm covering is very basic and I'm, I might be making mistakes there because I'm, I really don't care much for that rigor. But along the way, I'm, I, I really want to share these points like the wind power fluctuations or robust control because all of these are coming, all of these are real world problems in industry that are somehow coming back to statistical physics and dynamical systems and they're all waiting to be solved by us. So I want to leave you with a bunch of these open questions and you, you can go away with them, think about them and if you have something to do, if, if you think you have made headway on them, go write it up or patent it and do us all proud. All right, thank you. Thank you. So very good, so we resume the Zoom uh, uh, connection tomorrow at uh, five to nine.